now I will hand over to my moderator. I've got some something to write here earlier. Just start chatting. Um, I'm sure that you would much rather continue to chat with Carmela, but I guess I wouldn't be fulfilling my role if I didn't initiate the event officially. Apologies for the delay, but we were in the main event in the boardroom, and it has only just stopped, so we had to go through all the security to get back here. So a very warm welcome to Carmela and to all the people in the audience here. My name is Ishrat Lindblad, and in a rather egotistical manner, most moderators start by needing to present themselves because everybody knows the person they're going to discuss with. Um, my first encounter with Kamila Shamsi's work is something I will never forget because I had the privilege of working at a school in Karachi, the Lyceum, and we had a declamation contest. And one of the pieces that was selected for declamation, which also proceeded to win the prize, was a wonderful description read by one of our senior year students. And it was an extract from cartography. And it was about the most wonderful, moving, emotionally packed description of Karachi I could imagine. And I, who have not been born in Karachi, but came here running away from the uh, turmoil of partition in 1947 as a young girl of, 40, uh, of seven, and then have spent most of my adult life living in Sweden for the last 50 years, to be confronted with this young person's recollection of a city that really was full of beauty and so different from my own experience of the traffic and the rickshaws and the arrival at the terminal and all the ugly things that you keep seeing in Karachi. And suddenly to have this lyrical description that we called Karachi, I couldn't listen to that piece without tears in my eyes. And when I voted for the prize, I think there was a large part of my heart in that vote. And I thought, where does this come from? Because she didn't tell us. So directly after the contest, I went up to this girl and I said, where does this come from? I have to read that book. And she said, it's a book called Cartography by Kamila Shamsi. And what a clever title, Karachi Cartography, spelt with a K. I rushed to Liberty Books and I was lucky to get the book. And unfortunately, I feel very unhappy because I left that book in Sweden when I came to Karachi now. And I didn't know I would have the privilege of moderating with Kamila and getting her to sign that book. But the result has been that I rushed to Liberty Books and I bought In the City by the Sea, Salt and Saffron, Broken Verses, uh, Burnt Shadows, all four of the novels that have been available which I don't already possess. So I hope to get your signature on some of them. But unfortunately not on cartography, which is really the heart of my experience of Kamila. It's a great pleasure to have an opportunity to discuss with you. I guess you're very used to having people tell you that they know your mother very well. <laughs> Maybe not so many people who even knew your grandmother. So I feel extremely privileged and very honored to be able to introduce Kamila Shamsi, author of the novels that I've just named, and which very much address the title of this session, which I saw was Karachi, focusing around Karachi. Most of the questions I have to ask are not really directly related to Karachi, but we'll certainly start with Karachi. And I notice that you live in London and in Karachi, like many of us, children of the diaspora. So perhaps you'll speak a little bit about how you experience Karachi today compared to when you wrote cartography. Is this working? Yes, it's working. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for that. And again, apologies to those of you who well, twofold apologies. First to those who came at 11 and there was nothing going on, and then to those of you who just walked in and, and found yourself in a session already in progress. Um, I just, since there were some people here already by 11.15, we were just having a sort of informal chat, but this is the formal part um, of the evening, even though it's not an evening at all. <laughs> um, I actually, 
I don't anymore live in Karachi and London. I now live in London. Um, I come to Karachi um, just for a month or two in, in the winter. And I, I think it's important to make that distinction because um, there's a lot of this sort of, you know, she divides her time between. Um, and, and sometimes that, you know, means she lives 11 months in one place and travels around the next. Um, and I, I think it's important to make this distinction because for me, living in Karachi has actually, living and not living in Karachi has moved through three stages. In the first stage, I lived in Karachi. I grew up here. I went to school here. Um, in the second stage, I did move between places. Um, first as a student. Um, I was a student in America for seven years, during which time I would come back to Karachi every summer and winter, which meant five months in Karachi, seven months in America. Um, and then for several years after that, I was quite nomadic. So Karachi was my base. I'd be here for anywhere between three and six months of the year. And the rest of the year, I'd either be in America teaching or in London. Um, and it was in those years that I wrote actually all five of my novels, um, except for the end of Burnt Shadows, which part of which was written in the third stage. Um, and the reason I mention this is because all these novels about Karachi were written were written mostly in Karachi, because this has always been the place where I used to come and, and get all my writing done. Um, but my experience of Karachi was of one who used to leave, um, which meant I would be here long enough to feel I was living here. This was my primary base. Um, but I also used to go away and then see Karachi in opposition to some other place. Um, I would have um, the sort of these different layers over my eyes, these different layers of seeing. Um, one of them sort of the Karachi layer, one the London layer, one the America layer. Um, and you know, one layer would have to sort of replace the other um, and be peeled on and off. And sometimes, um, because these layers, let's say, are sort of somewhat transparent, I would see all these three places through the lens of the other. Um, so I was writing about Karachi as a Karachi wala, as someone who was living in Karachi, but also as someone who used to go away and see something else. Um, and then about three years ago, I moved to London. Um, and now I visit Karachi, I have to be honest about this. Um, I don't live here anymore. Um, and in, in some odd way, what I realized when I made the decision to stop being nomadic and actually live in one place and for that place to be London, it was that decision was made easier by the fact that I was writing Burnt Shadows, which for the first time was a novel that was not for me, a novel of Karachi. Um, there's a section in there that is set in Karachi, but the book starts in Nagasaki, it moves to Delhi, then it comes to Karachi, um, and then it moves to New York and Afghanistan. Uh, so I had to let go of the idea, which I'd always had, that the place I wrote about was the place I knew about and had lived in. Um, and once I was able to let go of that idea, um, I realized that in order, I didn't have to be in Karachi to be a writer that I could write about other places and I could move to other places. So it was a fairly sort of dramatic shift um, in the way I used to think about this city, my relationship to it, and my writing. Thank you. Uh, do you feel that there's a touch of nostalgia in your writing about Karachi now? Or do you think that you've managed to free yourself from that distant hills of greener? Well, I'm not writing about Karachi now. Um, that's a difference. Um, Although I would agree yeah. to some extent, but I feel that the section in uh, Burnt Shadows... Oh, no, sorry, I don't mean that, because that, that, the section Burnt Shadows was, was written when I was still largely in Karachi, but what I'm working on now is not set in Karachi. Okay. I don't think there's even a sentence in Karachi. Uh -huh. um, so it'll be... But, I mean, I sort of interrupted your question. No, no, it means that basically you've cut the umbil umbilical cord. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I don't know what I've done. Um, I was reading, uh, l late in, in the festival there's going to be a launch of Sunil Sethi's book, which is a, a collection of interviews with writers, which is wonderful. Um, writers always like to read what other writers say about writing. Um, and there's a moment in there when Anita Desai talks about the first time she stopped writing about India, and she said, uh, I'd been writing about it for many books, and I felt I had to, she said, I'd been writing about the same world for many years. And I felt I had to open the garden door and walk out. And when I read that, I thought, I recognize that feeling. But I also, it also occurred to me that I might be walking out the garden door in order to find another entry point back into the garden. Uh, so I'm certainly not saying I'm done with Karachi. I actually find that very unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, this next book is not a book of Karachi. The book after, who knows, it may well be. Uh, I hope to have many books left in me. And this continues to be a city which I think is one of the most interesting cities in the world. Um, so it may be that I'll come back, but I may come back to writing a different kind of Karachi. Um, and, you know, that question of nostalgia, um, I think the earlier books probably have more nostalgia than the first one, In the City by the Sea. Um, I think in some way is, because it's, it's telling a child's view of Karachi, um, it, it, that allowed me to filter out a lot um, that the child simply didn't see. Mm -hmm. So I think actually the earlier books are probably more nostalgic. I think I'm um, probably now at a point where I'm much more impatient with the idea of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was going to ask you if you'd actually been to Japan and to mm -hmm. Nagasaki in uh, doing the research for your book, or if you had actually visited Japan and that generated the impulse to link this one trauma with the other? Um, I hadn't been, and I still haven't been to Japan or to Nagasaki, and really my interest in, um, for those who don't know, Burn Shadow starts, uh, the first section, which is about 25 pages long, is the day the bomb falls on Nagasaki. Um, and I came at it in a roundabout way. I was, I was interested in, interested may be the wrong word. Um, I found my, myself unable to not think about um, nuclear warfare at a certain point. Um, and I suppose this had to do, I mean, I, I think if you go back to the origins of when I first started about writing, thinking about the book that would become Burnt Shadows, it was probably um, around late 2001, of course, when our two, the two countries were in a face-off. Um, and the fact, it, it just seemed odd to me that we had, you know, there was Pakistan and there was India, we were both nuclear armed, and yet you had very little conversation, it seemed to me, about what actually happens in a nuclear holocaust. We had lots of discussion about strategically why it's important for us to have the bomb if India has a bomb. That was endlessly discussed. But what happens? What happens in the moment? What happened in 1945 when the bombs were nothing? They were minute compared to the bombs we have now. Um, and I was struck by, in, actually, I'm going to correct myself, the origins of Burn Shadow starts in 1998. Um, the, the week that India tested its bomb, there were those few days before we did, right? Um, and in those few days, a group of Hibaksha, the, the survivors of the atom bomb, came from Hiroshima and Nagasaki to Pakistan. Now these were men and women who were, the youngest of them were in their 50s, the oldest were, I think, their 80s or 90s. Um, and these were people who had lived through nuclear war. And they came to Pakistan. Does anyone else remember this? Anyone? My mother remembers it, usually. Um, a couple of people. But it struck me as the most astonishing news story that there were these sort of 70s, 80s, 90-year-old people coming to Pakistan to say, please don't, because we know what it does, what this bomb does. Um, and that story just, it was just, I think, a short column on the back page of Dawn. And it just stuck in my head. At that point, I had no idea to become a novel. But in the way that, that things sort of grow, I suppose that the question of Japan and its connection via the nuclear bomb to Pakistan became interesting to me then. Um, and when I started writing the book, I realized at a certain point if I wanted to write this book, it just sort of, the, the character who occurred to me was a Japanese character. I hadn't really planned it, but I had an image in my head of a Japanese woman with her back towards me and three bird-shaped burns on her back um, from the kimono she was wearing when the bomb fell. Because one of the things that the bomb does is, um, th this is in the book Hiroshima by John Hersey, women who were wearing kimonos with, um, there you go, it's sort of somewhat there on the cover of it. Um, women who were wearing white kimonos with dark patterns on them, the white reflects the heat away from the body, the heat of the bomb, and the black absorbs it into the skin. So people ended up with tattoos on their skin in the shape of kimono patterns or belt buckles or, or shirt crisscross. And you, you can find these pictures, they're horrific. Um, and I was reading this detail and I just had an image of this woman with these burns on her back. And I knew right then, I mean, you, you asked me earlier how novels start. That's how the novel started. I thought, this is my character, I'm going to write about her. Oh God, she's Japanese, how am I going to do that? Um, but it was just a question of, if this is the image that keeps coming back, I have to at least try um, and see if I can start a novel written in a place I've never been, which I know absolutely nothing about. All I knew about Nagasaki was the bomb fell there. Um, and I'd always written, as I was saying, about Karachi, about a place I had grown up in. 
Um, and suddenly it seemed both terrifying and exciting to go as far in the opposite direction as possible. Um, and the first thing I knew was that what I had to be able to do in my head was recreate a Nagasaki before the bomb, which of course doesn't exist. There's no possibility of visiting it. Um, and I did this by extensive research. So photographs were very helpful, maps. I mean, I have in my head a map of Nagasaki. I feel convinced that if you dropped me into Nagasaki 1945, I could find my way around. Um, and, and sort of photographs and letters and testimonials. And there's lots of survivor testimony talking about that day itself and, and things like, you know, what was the weather and, and what were people eating and drinking and what were they wearing and, and all these kinds of things. I did at one point, just because I was now so interested um, in the place, I did think, well, maybe I should just go to Nagasaki. And I, I went online and I looked up visa requirements for a Pakistani citizen to go to Japan on a tourist visa. And on a tourist visa, we need a sponsor in Japan who will give not only his or her tax information, but that of his or her employer. And I thought, well, this is ridiculous. I mean, it's another way of saying, please don't bother. Um, so, so I didn't go. Uh, but I, I still hope to one day. I did, when the book was published, someone who teaches at the University of Nagasaki called me up and said, it's a wonderful book, and, and any time you want to come to Japan, I will sponsor you. So. So that's a out. trip I hope you plan That's a future. trip that will in one day, one day happen. Um, Actually, I was reminded a little bit of the short story and the connection, The Boat People, mm -hmm. by Nam Lee, mm. because he has written about Nagasaki the day yeah. before the dawn. Yeah. Yeah. And I wondered if you were familiar with that story. I read Nam's book. I, read it, uh, I just read it actually about six months ago. Uh -huh. um, so I read it, and it was published, I after, think... After yours. I well, it was certainly published after I'd finished writing it. I'm not sure if... Uh, Burn Shad is already out because there was an 18 month period before the time I finished it and the time it was published. But um, no, that book wasn't. It's a wonderful book for anyone who hasn't read it. That Nam Lee's The Boat, an amazing collection of short stories.